Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's Oracle Apex office hours. My name is Joel Coleman. I'm on the Oracle Apex product development team. And today we have uh, Menno Hogendijk, who's on the product development team, going to present super easy report printing in Apex 20.2. Not easy report printing, super easy. Um, if you have questions at any time, um, don't uh, ask them in the chat, but if you could please ask them in the Q&A function in, uh, in Zoom. And there will be a number of members of our team uh, online to be able to answer questions. And then we'll save some for Menno at the end as well. I just have a few quick announcements to get to, and then we'll get over to Menno, please. The replay of uh, last month's office hours, which was the um, largest, attendance, uh, largest attended Apex office hours we've had in history. Uh, what's new in Oracle Apex 20.2. This was the day after Apex 20.2 was launched. Um, the replay of that is available and I have the QR code there and I encourage everyone to uh, look at this if you haven't seen it. Also, just to make people aware, there are um, numerous blog posts, especially about new features in Apex 20.2 that the Apex team has produced on automations, uh, REST data source synchronization, uh, cards, uh, facet search enhancements, and all of these can be accessed on the Oracle Apex blog, blogs.oracle.com slash Apex. Just a quick um, request here for those of you in the Apex community. Um, last year, you were kind enough to complete a number of reviews of Oracle Apex on the Gartner Peer Insights review forum. And thanks to your efforts, we were given the distinction for the Gartner Peer Insights customer choice for low-code application platforms for Apex. And Gartner is doing this again this year. And I would encourage you, if, if you feel so inclined and you have 10 or 15 minutes, if you could please fill out a review of Oracle Apex um, on the Gartner Peer Insights site. And uh, if you follow this uh, bit.ly link, this link to um, complete a survey, then there will be some goodies that Gartner gives as well. Um, and I want people to know because uh, um, very often people are concerned about, will I remain anonymous or, or will I have to give my name or my company? Um, as far as what's published publicly, it is completely anonymous. They'll identify you by industry and size of company, but never by company name, never by name. And you can go out and review the Gartner Peer Insights review today and validate that yourself. Um, they have simplified the survey from last year um, that it should only take uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And for those of you who were kind enough to submit a review last year, uh, you can simply go in and update and augment your existing uh, survey. And that can also um, uh, count to this year's Customer Choice Award and understand as well that multiple people from the same company can submit reviews. So it doesn't have to be just one person from one company. And I'm not trying to uh, alter your scoring of Apex at all. I want people to be completely candid and honest, but I want you to also know that uh, to achieve the customer choice award that the score, uh, the average score has to be 4.6 or higher. And you might say, um, what will you get out of this if you take 10 or 15 minutes of your time? Um, for those uh, valid reviews, um, Gartner will give a three month access for um, select Gartner research and um, um, basically access to other research that industry analyst Gartner provides. So there is something in it um, for you. And for those of you who are uh, partners, if you encourage your customers to submit a review, um, they can also mention your company name um, in the review. And so everybody wins. And um, I'll just put this up there again, that uh, if you can go to this URL sometime in the next, uh, I would say 30 days, I think the, the period ends in December, but there's no time like the present. If, uh, if you could please do this at your convenience, we would be greatly appreciative. And then lastly, just to announce next month's office hours, we have a special edition on December 17th, for those who might know that there's a uh, open source utility called Flows for Apex. And uh, this is developed by a number of smart people in the Apex community from Europe. And this provides um, 
the ability to not only do process modeling, but execution of process flows within Apex. And uh, they're going to give a, a demonstration of this open source solution that they've craft, crafted. And this will be next month on uh, Thursday, December 17th. We hope you can join us. And with that, I'll turn this over to Menno, please, for super easy report printing in Apex 20.2. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, my name is Menno, and I joined the team last year in 2019. And ever since, I've been working on the uh, report printing options in Oracle Apex. And you saw the first version of that in 20.1. 20.2 has a lot more to offer. So I will start sharing my screen. And to start off, I made this little application. It's a really simple application. I call it the document converter. And I put it on apexoracle.com in our PM workspace. If you want to use it, you can use this URL. Basically what it does is it uses the, if you know Apex, we have the capability, the capability to upload data using these file types and transform it into a relational table. So let me choose this file here. I have a CSV file and it's a really simple file. The first row contains the headers and then all that data. So let's use that file. Nothing's happened yet. It's just inserted into the page. I know that the first row is a header and I'm immediately able to transform that data into any of these formats. Let's pick HTML, for example. And there is my HTML. Do you want something else? Maybe you want PDF. There is my PDF. I can go further, right? Let's pick Excel. This is a new format in Apex 20.2. I can open it up. And I hope you can see it. Let's zoom in a little bit. You can actually change the sorting here. I can sort like this, close the file and save it. Choose that file. as input and let's see what we want to do with it now maybe again to pdf to show you what it did and you see the data has been adjusted asia comes first i can turn it into json and this json format is what you might have seen already if you use orts for example you have your items and then each row is an object i can create apex land here doesn't really matter, save that. Choose the JSON file that I just created to open it up. Now JSON doesn't have header rows. I can turn this to HTML. And there's my Apex land. Uh, and the last one is XML, for example. Where you have your row set and your rows and all your columns. Was this easy to make this app? Yes, very easy. It took me less than one hour to set it up, make it look a bit pretty. And uh, uh, that's how easy it is to do report printing in Apex 20.2. So let's go to my slides. I already introduced myself. And let's talk a bit about the history, what we had before Apex 20.2. We had a few reporting components, the classic report, the interactive report, and the interactive grid. And they all have their own code base, how to do report printing. And um, the interactive grid actually used the data export API internally. And we didn't expose it, but it was there and it could do CSV and HTML. So what we try to do for 20.2 is align all these components and use one single point of definition if you want to do data exports. And that became the data export API we already had in place. So you can imagine a lot of uh, code has re been removed from the classic report and the interactive report. So it supports four formats if you use it from your page designer at least. CSV, HTML, Excel, which is new in 20.2, and PDF. 
right? The PDF was introduced in 20.1, but only available for the interactive grid. In 20.2, all regions for reporting can make native PDFs. And we extended the PDF to uh, allow you to use Chinese, Japanese, and Korean languages. And I'll show you in a minute what that actually means, because it wasn't so straightforward as it might seem. And then we will talk about the Arab language, for example, as well. Because it's such a powerful API, we decided to expose this API for end users, for our developers. And it's called the Apex Data Export API. And it allows you to export your query in these four formats already discussed. And additionally, we have XML or JSON. Now, as a shortcut, like say, if you have a region and you have a data source for that region and you want to export that data, it could be a classic report where you want to have your own custom button, or it might be a region which doesn't support report printing uh, from page designer. You can use the Apex region dot export data. So, Let's take a look at our application that we have today. I will close all the screens open right now. I have a simple report printing app. And first things first, let me show you. I've showed this already in the uh, previous office hours uh, that you now can set your print server in your application, not only on instance level. To do that, you go to edit your application definition, and you'll find this new section here called report printing. By default, if you update to the latest release 20.2, you will use the instance settings. But you can change if you want to, to use native printing or use a remote print server. Let's pick this one, and I've already set one up, but I'll show you what it means how you create such a remote print server. So this is using the analytics cloud, right? Maybe you run Oracle Apex in the Oracle cloud and you also have the analytics cloud. And now we have a really easy integration. Uh, it works exactly the same as on-premise. If you have BI Publisher, you have report templates, stuff like that. It works just the same. Just the setup is a little bit different. So let's find out how that works. To add a report print, remote print server, you go to Workspace Utilities, All Workspace Utilities, and here you'll find a section about the remote servers. Now I have defined my server here, but if you do it yourself, you could create a new one. You give a name, static identifier, you specify it as a print server and point it to a URL. Once you're done with that, make sure to add your credentials because this uh, analytics cloud needs to be logged in. And it's using basic authentication. So in my report printing app, I have a page for external printing. I'm using a simple report. It's a classic report. And I've specified uh, that printing should be enabled. So let's go and change this classic report. We want to make sure that we enable PDF as a download option. One thing you'll notice in 20.2, if you're looking for your region attributes, they're right here at the right section. Uh, again, next to the region properties, you have your classic report properties, attributes. Scroll all the way down, you can enable printing. If you do that, the default format will be PDF, and it will use the default report layout, but I've uploaded a different one called tasks. Again, nothing's changed here, just so you are aware how to do this stuff. You will get a print link at the bottom of your region. And now it will call that Analytics Cloud API. And there's one thing that changed, but first let us have a look at the report that it's creating behind the scenes. It contains all my tasks in a special report layout. The way we communicate with the analytics cloud is a new way. So if you look at our uh, PL SQL API in 20.2, we now use to connect to the uh, analytics cloud using multi-part form requests. 
So you can append things to your multi-part form. And when you're ready, you can generate a request body from your multi-part form. This is internally what we use, but if you need multi-part form requests uh, in REST, then know it's available for you as well. Or maybe you want native printing instead. That's fine. You can edit your application properties, go to report printing and choose native printing. And this is what we'll use for the rest of my demo. I don't even need to refresh this page. I can immediately hit this print button and see how fast it is to generate that PDF. Yeah, it's native functionality and your data is there. What else changed in 20.2 in Page Designer and in your application probably? Let's look at the classic report. Um, so as we know, Excel and PDF can now be downloaded natively. Uh, but the thing I want to show you here for the classic report is to download as a CSV. And let's open this up with my text editor. And I have to change one thing I see here. Sorry about that. Because that spoils my demo. save this because the CSV format changed a little bit we now respect the CSV specification and what it means is um, we don't always use this double and quote uh, and closing of the value but only when it's needed so in this case I have a comma and the comma is used as the CSV separator that's why this value is enclosed by double quotes what we used to do in 20.1 by default always was uh, to use double quotes for every value. This is a 20.1 instance, by the way. I download my classic report. Let's see how it looks. You see, that's a small change, but uh, we experienced that some customers use this CSV output as input to another system, and that other system might require uh, these double quotes to be present. It's a small minor thing, but if you have this issue, I suggest to edit your report. If you go to your source, you can now add an optimizer hint, and it's called CSV legacy. And when you do that, as we already have seen, then the classic report will use quotes for each and every value. If you look at the interactive report, um, let's take the all features. Then you will see that all these features can be applied and they will be respected in the data exports or the downloads. So if, for instance, if I choose HTML, you will see that everything is maintained. My control breaks, my highlights, my aggregates, stuff like that. This data only option is new. So if you're interested in your data, but not these extra features, download it again using data only. And now you will see you will have your table and nothing else being applied. Another new feature is that you can send your downloads as email, it used to be HTML only, but now every format. So I can type here a sample mail address. And in the background, Apex will generate an Excel file for you, sends it to your email address. And uh, let's close a few tabs. Now we can check if this uh, email has arrived. It's not there yet. Let's wait and see a few minutes later. What I want to show uh, with Excel as well is the file itself, because we had the data parser already. And the Excel file itself looks like this. It's everything you see on your page you will get in your Excel file as well. We have the column headers. They are frozen, which is really nice. 
and the first column in this case is frozen as well. Then we maintain everything we can, like the control breaks, the highlights and the aggregates. We even, if we can, maintain the format mask. So we know this is a date column. It stays a date column in Excel. We know this is a number column displayed as a currency and we respect that as well. Uh, if you open this up, let's say you go to your downloads. This is the way we do it internally, just to give you a sneak preview. An Excel as X file is basically a zipped file. So you can unzip it. And what is it inside? Well, it's full with XML files. That's the only thing and they're all connected to each other. But um, we follow the specification because we have APEX zip. We can create zip files. We can create XML files. So it was relatively easy for us to uh, generate native XLSX. Of course, you have to stay within the boundaries of the specification. And if you want to know more about it, it's the open office XML file format. My mail has arrived and you'll see that it has one attachment and that's my interactive report, which I can download. And I get the same content, of course but I checked the data only option. So now it looks like this. If it's data only, we turn it into an Excel table, which means you will get this filtering out of the box. If you go to your table settings in Excel, you will see that it has a name that's good for accessibility. It contains headers. You can enable or disable the headers. You can enable or disable these filter buttons, the drop down buttons, all that stuff out of the box. Another thing we do is we change the column widths for you on the fly. So we determine what the longest length is and we have a maximum, of course, but we always try to create an Excel file that looks good when you open it up. Let's go back to our application and look at the PDF format and I will use the interactive grid because PDF is basically, it's the, I can say that it's the hardest format uh, to render. And the reason is you work with text and with fonts. And in PDF, it's not like, uh, please print this text on a page. No, you have to draw each character on a page. And how much characters can you uh, print on one line? That depends on the font that it's in use. So you have to determine when to do the line breaks, stuff like that. You have to include the font files. And in Apex 20.2, we added support for Japanese, Korean, and Chinese languages. So what if we translate Mr. King to let's say Japanese? We just copy this value and append it to the name like that. Blake, let's use a Euro sign here because uh, uh, I will show you in a minute by default, we will use the Helvetica font to generate a PDF. And this is one of the core fonts in PDF. But Japanese characters or a Euro sign, they are not present in this Helvetica font. So what happens if you download to PDF? And I will open it with my professional Acrobat reader. You will see that it's generated exactly the same as in Apex, you see the Euro sign and the Japanese characters. But one thing to notice, if you go to the file, choose properties, that there are fonts. So Helvetica and Helvetica Bold are there, right? That's for all the other data, which is non, uh, which is ASCII characters. We don't need to include these fonts. This is what we call the core PDF fonts each PDF reader is able to display Helvetica and Helvetica Bold, uh, Courier and Times. For all the other fonts, we have to embed them. So for instance, we use Japanese uh, font from Noto, Google Noto. Not only do we embed it into the PDF, but it has been subsetted because this Noto JP regular font that has over 60,000 characters or glyphs in it, and it's quite big. As you can see here, where I have 
the font itself, it's 4.5 megabytes. So we do not want to add all that data into your PDF. If you download your PDF, it's just 14 kilobytes. So behind the screens, we are subsetting the font file. And we do the same for the Oracle regular font file. Now to support Arab languages, we need to do more. Because yes, we are able to parse and subset the font file. Let me show you an example. If I make this an Arab text, it's kind of small and I copy this value. Let's put it here. And what I've done here in my local instance, I've uploaded the Arabic font as well. But that doesn't mean we're ready. We need to do more and I'll show you. PDF. And as you can see, yes, the characters are there, but they are not connected to each other. That's the first thing. They're not in reversed order. So we need to add these features uh, while we are generating the text for the PDF file to make it look exactly like you see here. And this is a thing that we're still working on. And it's, uh, I hope to uh, be able to add it soon to Apex. The last thing I want to show you in this application is if you have, let's say the new cards region, it doesn't support data exports or downloads out of the box because probably you want it to look like a card uh, when you download it. But anyway, you could use our new API, the Apex region .export data. And the way to do this, uh, I will show you. So we go ahead and edit this cards region. We will add a button. Let's call it uh, download. And the position should be in the edit place. It's text with icon, it's hot, and it uses FA download. And it submits the page, that's fine. And then you will probably want to add a process. If you click that button, when button press download, execute some PL SQL to generate your export. And to do that, I go to the PL SQL API reference again. And we go to the Apex region. And here you will find the new export data function. It has three required parameters, a format, a page ID, and a region ID. A lot of options, uh, but we'll keep it simple now. If you're interested, please make sure to read through these APIs. Copy this because I like this code snippet, paste it in my application. I need to make a few changes because the application ID is 101 and the page ID is eight. Static ID is cards. And here is another instance of my page ID. And then it should work, right? Let's validate it. What did I do wrong? Sorry. Always good to validate. Okay, save that changes, run the page again. Cards, now please download it for me. And we will get an error. Downloads are not supported. If you set reload on submit, which is a page level attribute to only for success. And it gives us two options. You can change the attribute to always or use it before header process. Let's go ahead and change our page. This is my page. I scroll down through the attribute that I want to see, which is called reload on submit. Indeed, it's set to only for success. So we can try to use always instead. But Unfortunately, it fails because I also have an editable interactive grid on this page and that cannot use uh, the always uh, that we just specify. It wants reload on submit set to only for success. So I have to revert this change I just did. And luckily they gave us another way to do it. So the process, which we call download, shouldn't be after submit, but can also be on page load. And then you have to add a condition. So I add it to, let's say before header. I will change the condition itself, not when the button is pressed, but let's say 
when the request is equal to download. What I then need to do, because here is my pre-render process now, is add another after submit process, which is a branch and that will work. Branch to download. I will go to the same page. In this case, I want to add a request and that was what we specified would be download. And I only want to execute the branch whenever this button is pressed. Now we go to our cards region, we download. And there is our HTML file. And what you see is not the cards region itself, but it's the data source that it's based on. That's the only thing we know. If we look in page designer, we see that the cards region doesn't have columns. It doesn't have uh, printing attributes. It only has a source and the source is a table. So my export contains all the columns of that table. And if we cannot uh, uh, look into the data, we, this is a blob column, we will say that it's the unsupported data type, but it will not raise an error for you. So that's what's changed in, uh, in the page designer and in your application as well. And now let's go talk more about these APIs because we just had, uh, we used one already, let's use more. And we'll close everything up again. For that, I'm using a RESTful service. I've created one because it's very easy and elegant to show you how to use what we call the Apex Data Export API. I will start with the basics. Right here, I have an almost empty uh, REST endpoint. I can execute it here in my browser to see if it works and it prints exactly what I wanted, hello world. Now let's say you have a query and that could be any query. Let's say you want information from your AMP table, but not just AMP table, you join it with the department and then the manager, it's a self join and this would be the output. Let's say you want to export that data. You don't have a report, nothing. It's your own query. What we then have for you now is the Apex Data Export API. So I go to this new API, you can read all about it. And one thing it has, I will start with is the download procedure because the example for this is very relevant for what we want to do today. It basically needs an export and then it will download it. So the response of my REST request would be a downloaded uh, export. I will copy it for now and then explain more what it means. The way the data export API works is that you open up a query context. The APEC exec package is available since a few releases. You can basically run any query from your local database and that is your context. We then pass the context to the APEX data export that export function we say we want the result of that query in CSV and the file name should be employees. After that, because we manually opened our context, we have to close it again. Even when an exception happens, we want to close it. And finally, we want to able to download our export. So let's improve this a little bit. I want to use this query, not the example query. So we can just paste it in here. I don't want CSV right now. Let's use a parameter, a URL parameter format. And if that's not present, then let's take HTML instead. I want indeed to download the export, but I want to use the content disposition in line so you can immediately see what the contents are. And this is called apex data export.c inline. Inline. It also tells me here that it by default calls 
stop Apex engine. But because we are using ORNs, we're not in the Apex context, we need to add this and set it to false in order to not raise any errors. So this is what we have right now. Looks good. Apply changes. And let's check it out if it works. I can just refresh this. And oh boy, I get an error. Because <clears throat> the Apex exec package needs to run in the context of an application. And that's no issue. We just need to attach uh, or create a new session. And luckily, there's another API to do that. It's called Apex session that creates session. Again, I scroll down to the example, how to set up a session. I need these lines of code. Edit just before we open up our query context. And the application I have was 101, for example. It doesn't really matter because I have 100 as well. And that's in place. We refresh this. And you will see that I get in line my HTML response from the query I just provided. So this is very basic. You can do a lot more with the uh, data export API. So you can change some columns. Ename might not ring a bell to your end users, the same as DNAME. The second example shows you that you can change a lot when it comes to your columns. It's the same code. I open up my query, but this has changed. I'm specifying, I'm overriding the default behavior of the data export API, and that is to include all the columns for my query. But now I'm explicitly adding each and every column, changing some of the headings. Because this is the first uh, column I add, which is the department, and it's ordered by department number, I can make it into a column break. And for the higher date, I add a format mask, and the rest has stayed exactly the same. If you would run this now, you will see indeed, I use a different column header for the control break as well. And it is indeed a control break and it looks a lot nicer. Let's add the next thing. Maybe you want to add uh, column groups as well. Let's go to that example. Code is almost the same, but I add two column groups. So I have an empty array of column groups and I ask the Apex data export to add an entry to my array. And it gives me as output the group that it just created. And the column group name is gonna be employee. That is for the first columns, for all these columns. And then the location that will get the department column group. So then I add another column group and these group IDs are reference. So in the add column, you can reference in which group it should reside. The department group is added for the location column. The extra thing you need to do is uh, pass the column groups that you've just defined to the Apex data export function. Let's overwrite this one. And now you see, I have my employee columns that ends here all together and I have my department column, just one. We can add highlights as well. And highlights is a bit different because you need to change your query. I say, I'm gonna define highlights. I didn't add them yet. And here it is. So in your query, you now have to specify highlight columns. And what it means is, whenever my job is manager, then I want to apply highlight ID number one. Whenever my job is salesman, I want to apply highlight ID number three. And this is a next one. This is a column highlight. Whenever my salary is more than 3000, I want to apply highlight ID three. Here we add those highlights. I add them to my collection. I say highlight ID number one can be found if that row highlight column has the value of one. So this number and this number should always be the same. The same for two and two. 
we search in the row highlight column. When the value is two, then we apply this highlight. And what should we do when we apply the highlight? We change the background color. This one is a column highlight. Whenever a highlight ID three is found in the call highlight column, we apply a background color, we apply a text color and the display column. And that makes it not a row highlight, but a column highlight is gonna be the salary column. The only extra thing you need to do, pass these highlights and that's it. Copy this, change it. And that's applied. Everything that I wanted, I see my managers, I see my sales managers and I see salaries above 3000. That's really nice. I even can add aggregates like, okay, that's nice that it's grouped by departments, but uh, I want to see the total salary per department. And then at the bottom, I want to see the total salary for all employees. Here's where you would add aggregates. I have two minutes before my session turns out, but that's okay. I can always log in again. What we add here is yet another two columns. And I will open this up and run this in SQL Dev to show you what happens. So we have our row highlights, right? Whenever as a manager, apply highlight one. Whenever uh, uh, the salary is more than 3,000, apply highlight three. And because we order by the department number, we can now get the total of the accounting department as one column using an analytic function, sum over the uh, partition by the department number. That's your department salary, the total. For research, the total is this number. For sales, the total is this number. And the grand total, sum everything over. Everything is gonna be this number. We can pass that using the add aggregate function. So I wanna add one aggregate. Uh, the label is gonna be the sum. I want to apply a format mask. And this aggregate should be displayed under the salary column. The value that you need to display is this column in the SQL statement. Then I have a grand total, overall total. The total sum can be found in this column. And then we apply that aggregate. And there it is, now I have my sum. Here's a sum, and at the end I have my total sum. And it even goes faster, uh, further. If you change your format, let's say in PDF, that's fine, because PDF is capable of generating all this information as well. If you would do, let's say XML, you will get your plain data, just your row sets and your rows. You lose all that information. There is another internal uh, uh, PXML format, which is for printing. Notice right now that these higher date is an ISO formatted date string. With PXML, you just see what you get on your screen. And now the higher date becomes a VARCAR2 value. That's a small thing, but if you use this uh, format to create a, a XML that you send to your report print server, then you know uh, what the difference is. JSON is a very simple format, like XML. It's just items array. But the PJSON actually supports everything. So I have my whole print configuration, my time zone, my NLS settings, my column groups that I've defined, my columns. It's all metadata. Then I have my aggregates here, my highlights, and here my row start. And it adds another object at the end of a row, if you have special features for that row, this is gonna be start of a control break. On row two, this highlight should be applied. And on row three, there's a column highlight to be applied. If you want, you can use this. Uh, if, you, if you have an external print server, let's say you wanna use a JavaScript library to print something, you can use this advanced PJSON format, which includes everything from your data export. 
Okay, now I need to sign in again. That's gonna be easy. Last thing you can do is add some styling. Because we looked at our PDF and it doesn't contain, let's say, a page header. That would be nice, right, to add something else. What you would do is add the print config, add everything else we have in place, and then we get override the default print config. We assign a page header, we set the font size of that page header and the color, and we specify another border width. We pass that print configuration, and I've added a supplemental text, text as well. And this is really everything you can do. Now it's HTML. So indeed, it includes the page title. In PDF, it will become more clear. Format is PDF. Then we indeed change these uh, colors as well. You see my supplemental task here, text here. Everything is applied. Now to go one step further, you don't need to download the result of your data export because it's all native PL SQL. You can say, I want to export exactly what we just did, except I don't want to download this data. I'm just exporting it here, closing my context, and I'm sending an email. I'm using a static uh, mail template that I've defined, specified to who I'm uh, from who it is. I'm adding an attachment. And this is why this works so well together, because the export object contains everything you need to have in order to add an attachment to your mail. The blob, the file name, and the MIME type. I'm pushing the queue to get my email right away. And that's it. I'm closing it again. This is a post request. So what I've done here in my Insomnia REST client I'm specifying the format that I want to use, my name, and to who I should send it to. Let's clear the history and then send this information. And it indeed sends the data export there. Now, I hope it's fast enough to show you that if I open my webmail again, I have a new spam, so probably that's it. Yes, it is created right now. I see that I have a nice formatted email about an employee overview. I get some images. And at the end, there's one attachment attached to it. I can download it. And it is exactly the same file we just saw, but this time it's using Excel. So you can do a lot with the data export API. You can make the report, change the look and feel exactly like the features you have in your interactive grid or your interactive reports. The only thing we don't have for PDF right now is let's say you want a logo in your application. I set a very simple demo up. It's right here. And I'm using a plugin. So I know that JS PDF exists and I have added a button to this page. And let me show you. Because on click, it will kick off a dynamic action. I hope it's fast. Let's see this in action. So I'm having my region. I'm going to print this. And it creates an export. And right here, you see that indeed a logo is present. This uh, font is wrong because now I've added this Arabic text. But in general, it looks pretty OK to me. How does this work? The print has a dynamic action, and on print, I'm calling my JS PDF plugin. 
So what I'm doing is I'm downloading the data from my server whenever I click this uh, button. And then I say to JS PDF, please turn it into a PDF for me. And I want you to add a static file as my logo. If you would look inside of this uh, page, if you go and inspect, you will see what happens if I open the network tab. Right now it's empty. If I print, then you see an AJAX call has been made and the response type is XML. It also gets my image. But this is the most important type because I can parse my XML using JavaScript. You can even change it if you want. Let's say I want to have the PJSON format. Just reload your page. Print this region again with the print button. And now you will see I'm getting that response as JSON. And there is my report again. So this is just to show you that even if you use an external JS library, you can still use that uh, functionality we have uh, using the data export API. And I'm using JS PDF and it's really easy to set up. You just load the library. They have a example here, how to print cells. And that's all I did. So it's not a full blown plugin, but uh, uh, it shows you the, the capabilities of data exports in combination with another library. But I agree, like uh, a logo is, is definitely something that we, we should look into. And that concludes my demo of today. So, uh, Joel, do you have, uh, are no, there any questions? Uh, yeah, not so fast. They've been coming fast and furious. Oh, wow. Um, um, and and uh, a lot of these are already asked and answered, but I have a general question as well is you've showed a fair amount of code, code examples. Where can people see some of this code, especially the, the examples that you showed in the REST services? Uh, we have to think about it, but uh, sure, I can, we can make them uh, publicly available. They, they just uh, use the AMP and DEP table, so why not find a place? Uh, maybe I can use that uh, Apex PM, Apex uh, website again to download uh, the uh, REST uh, export. Sure. Either that or even a, um, a couple of examples that we could put in a blog post too, right? Oh, sure. they, all, yeah. they all build on each other. <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, EJ asked, is it possible to generate an Excel file with multiple sheets? We have a low level Excel engine. We just don't expose it. Um, so the answer is no. But there, in reality, there's no reason why it's not possible. It's, used, it's, it's possible internally, but we don't expose this as an option. Right. Any plans to expose it as an option? Yeah, we can think about it. Not, not, not real plans for 21.1, but uh, we can think about it. Okay, great, Leno. Uh, next one from ND asked, how about using an XSLT to public XML data as HTML? That could probably work. Uh, that was not the goal of the data export API, but uh, of course, if you have an XML file, you can transform it to HTML if you want. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I thought even the database supplied an XSLT processor. I could be wrong. I think that might be true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alexander asked, do we have a PL SQL API in 20.2 to write Excel files procedurally like VBA, for example, or like Apex zip package writes zip files? I, I think I could answer this. I think you've demonstrated programmatically generating these, right? True. But the ability to just write to cells and point out where you want to start in the sheet, we have a low level engine, it's just not exposed. And I'm not sure if, if, if we, we are going to expose it or we keep it as is. But we could have an Apex, a, a XLS package. Yes, that could in theory be something we offer. Okay. I, I interpreted that question as a way to programmatically generate these and do something with it rather than just only download, which I think you've demonstrated here. Mm, true, true. Uh, okay, multiple people asked, are there any plans to support chart printing? We have thought about it. There's no nothing concrete yet. And we, the main issue right now for 21.1 is the 
PDF language support. That's the most uh, obvious thing we need to include. And after that, um, yes, logos, uh, charts, we can all think about it, yes. Um, but it might be something Excel specific. I don't know. We have to really think about all of that. Yep. Sure. Okay, uh, next one, our buddy Ari asked, uh, is there any workaround for RTL languages? Right, like uh, like Arabic or Hebrew. A any workaround before this eventually becomes natively supported? Yes, you can use if you install, uh, let's say an old version of ORTS before 19.4, you can use BI Publisher, AOP. Uh, I even know there is a Jasper Reports integration so there's a few external report servers that you can use, but unfortunately with native PDF, there's no way to, uh, to render Arabic content. Okay. W with the native functionality, that's in 20.2, right? Right. That's true. Yep. It's coming. Okay. Uh, next one from uh, Francois. He said, uh, every report I've ever developed for a company, they wanted their logo, a report title, date, had it repeated on every page and page numbers. How do I do this? Or I guess the question you would be, when could he do this natively? It's still open for discussion. This is, uh, again, not something to expect in 21.1. We get these questions a lot. Uh, right now, it's just for plain tabular structure uh, data where we offer a few options. We do not support a full-blown template-driven uh, uh, PDF reports. OK, thanks, Menno. Uh, two more here. Uh, Tony asked, is it possible to render a barcode in the PDF output? Right now, no, it would be the same as the logo. So that would possibly be an image. Uh, so no, I, I did hear about maybe an Apex uh, has like a barcode, uh, plans to add a barcode uh, image uh, displayer. But right now, no, there's no uh, capability to add a barcode. Okay, uh, maybe this one was already asked. I don't have it in my list here, but I do remember somebody asked, is it possible to generate uh, a master detail output in, uh, in PDF using these facilities, right? So, you know, order and order details. Only using, um, let's say the control break. And that's what I've done before. Let's say you have your departments, you can add your department name as a control break and then the employees below it. That is, uh, so far, what is supported for master detail. Okay, thanks, Mino. And last one from um, Hachimi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is there any size limit into what you could uh, print or generate? Mm, Excel has uh, uh, predefined sizes. Uh, you can find them online. I don't Excel, Excel limit. That will get you to the Excel limits. For the others, no, not really. It depends on uh, your database performance. I know PDF is the slowest to generate because there's a lot of uh, things going on behind the scenes to print it all nicely on the page. The others, no, no, just your database performance. You have to wait maybe a long time. D database performance, but also I would think because this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is being instantiated in memory, which would consume PGA. So there's going to be you know, if you try to generate a billion row PDF, you're going to hit some database limitations as well at some point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Outstanding. Um, excellent session, uh, Menno. This is just completely uh, well done. And to all of our attendees, um, thanks for joining us today. We're truly grateful for your time and the great support we get from the Apex community. Um, this recording should be made available within the next couple of days. And as I mentioned earlier, please join us next month on December 17th for our next session. It's Flows for Apex, which is process modeling and execution in Apex. Um, until then, uh, we hope you and your families remain healthy and safe, and we'll see you again next month. Have a great day. Bye.